Hello, hello, there we go, we're on. Um, thank you to the four people who are already watching, that's very impressive, you're uh, one minute early, well done. Um, <laughs> next time if you could leave an apple on my desk, um, that'd be nice, but um, no, thank you all very much for tuning in. Um, yeah, in today's uh, today's Folky Fridays, we're on number 26, I can't believe I've done 26 of these already, time flies when you're having fun. Um, but yes, the, the topic of today's Folky Fridays is going to be um, drop D tuning. And I realised recently this is quite a major oversight on my part. I haven't actually done any videos about drop D yet, um, which is funny. I don't know why that's slipped my mind, because um, I absolutely love drop D and I use it all the time, much more than I generally use dadgad, actually. Um, but yeah, so uh, drop D is a really, really great tuning. Um, there's several reasons why it's nice. I mean, you've got the low kind of big booming bass note for D, which is the most common folk key and modes related to D. Um, so that's a really good thing to have. But you don't have the having to learn a complete new set of chord shapes, which you get in Dadgad. Um, so for that reason, it can be a really nice kind of middle ground between standard tuning with its um, easy shapes and kind of fairly easy way of working out music theory and dadgad where you've got um, nice big ringing strings and you can make a lot of use of the open strings but it's not necessarily so intuitive to work out where uh, where you would be able to to put your fingers to get certain different shapes uh, certain different chords um, so if you are out there watching if you could just um, leave us a little comment say hello let us know who we've got um, and um, it might be worth as well um, tuning your guitar to drop D so that we're all matching. If you are having trouble tuning your guitar, um, you could get a tuner, and if you really want to support the Folk Friend channel, you could get a tuner from um, finaleguitar.co.uk forward slash shop where I do have them for sale with um, both UK and international postage. <laughs> While you're there, why not check out my books? Hiya, Pierce. Thanks for tuning in. Ah, that's good. You're a, I know you're a, a Drop D user, so that's, um, this will be interesting for you, I expect. Um, cool. Hey, Keith. Thanks for coming back to us. Hope you're well. Yeah, so I'll, I'll start out having a little look at um, D major because obviously that's the key that you're most commonly going to play with drop D in. And generally, if I'm sat in a session or something and I hear a tune start up in D major or D minor um, or D mixolydian, um, then I will drop the D string because I like the, the bassiness if you don't drop the D string, you've only got the top four strings for your first chord, so it really sounds quite thin. And if you're in a session particularly, um, your place within the kind of frequency spectrum is kind of down the bottom. You know, your higher frequencies are going to be drowning out um, melody players, but your lower frequencies aren't going to clash with anybody other than perhaps a boron player. So... Um, your low frequencies are really the ones that are going to be important as a as a backing guitarist, um, and that's why it's good to have this this low bass note. So if you are um, playing in drop D and you're completely new to drop D, most um, chord shapes which don't use the bottom string you will be able to play the same, and obviously with your D chord you'll be able to play all the strings. There's a really handy um, cheating tip for all the rest of the chords in a D major chord scale and you can do them all by sliding one shape up and down the neck um, so you can do those kinds of things so the way you do that for I know, I'm sure Pierce and Keith, you probably already know this, but I'll run you through it anyway, just for people that are watching back. 
Um, the way you do that, you do E minor as your chord two, so rock and roll fingers on the second fret. And then, if you slide that up two frets, just keep your middle finger on, so your middle finger's on the fourth fret of the bottom string. Then you get this shape, where you put your uh, index finger on the second fret of the G string. And this shape is then the one that's going to slide and give you all the other chords. So, with this shape, whatever note your middle finger is pressing down on, that is the root note of the chord that you end up with. Um, so at the moment my middle finger is on the 4th fret of the D string, which is an F sharp note, so this is going to be some sort of F sharp chord. And then the index finger tells you if the chord is minor or major. So at the moment there's uh, a gap of 2 frets between my 2 fingers. You can see there's uh, a spare fret here if you like. So this is a minor chord, so this is a kind of F sharp minor with some extra notes in it. Um, and if I moved that index finger up a fret, that would convert it to F sharp major. So if you know the chords in the key that you're in, those the seven chords available in every key. Um, you're probably only going to use six of them. Um, so long as you know what those are, you can just slide this shape around and find all of them. And if you want to know what the seven chords are, you can work them out really quickly and easily using the amazing mode wheel, which I will post a link to in the comments just now so you can uh, have a look at that in case you're struggling to work out what chords go with tunes in different modes there you go yeah so uh, the third chord is going to be my F sharp minor chord like this and then I'm going to slide up one because the fourth chord is G G major um, and so for that one I want my middle finger on the fifth fret which is where the G note is and I want my index finger in the major position so that it's um, on the fourth fret, one fret down from where the middle finger is. And the index finger goes on the G string. So that gives me this nice kind of G chord. Then I slide that up two frets, that gives me my A, A major chord. And then I slide up two more frets and I make the index finger in the minor position and that gives me B minor, which is my sixth chord. And you can actually, if you're feeling cheeky, you can slide that shape up two more frets and get a substitute for the diminished chord, the seventh one. And then if you go all the way up to the twelfth fret, way up here, and put your index finger in the major position, then you get D major again. With that shape, um, when you're playing the vast majority of the chords that you'll want to make with that shape, you want your middle finger just to rest gently on the A string so that it mutes it. Um, the only one where you don't want to do that is the A chord, because if you leave an A note in an A chord, obviously that's going to sound fine. Um, so yeah, that, that chord shape, the slidable chord shape, is basically super useful for loads of stuff in D. Um, and let's just have a look at one thing which I made a video about a little while ago but I want to cover it in a slightly different way just which I like to use in, in drop D only um, the uh, the thing is um, changing chords in a kind of syncopated way so I'll give you an example if I just play I'll play um, one A parts worth of just D, G and A and then I'll play the same chords, but I'll change into some of them a little bit early. And you'll see you get this cool kind of syncopated rhythm going on. I'll do it with a normal jig pattern. So, uh, one, two, three, and. Here comes the syncopation. of things. So what I was doing there was instead of changing on the first beat of the bar where my foot taps are, um, I'm actually moving chord one quaver too soon. So 
One, two, three, four, five, six. 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 And that just generally is a really nice thing to practice, either with jigs or with reels. You can do it with either, um, because it gives the 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 backing this kind of cool syncopated feel. Um, if I demonstrate with a reel now, just so you can have a look at that, I'll do the same chord progression with uh, your standard reel pattern. So, one, two, three, and. Here it is normal. Here it is syncopated. Something like that. So there's there's these kinds of effects you can get by just changing chord a little bit too early. The thing which is specific to drop D, which you can do with these, if I go back to my jig pattern, is when you, um, as well as changing in a syncopated way um, one quaver too soon, you actually also approach that chord from one of its adjacent neighbours. So the, the most common one that you'll hear loads of Celtic guitarists do all the time um, is something like this. One little progression which I think it's actually worth practicing as a kind of exercise is just this one. Something like that. So what I'm doing there is going D, 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 and then when I get to an upstroke, I'm changing to um, the F sharp minor chord. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five like that. So the fourth quaver of the second bar is where I'm changing to that um, F sharp minor chord. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. And on the six, which is also an up, I change to the G and then I carry on as normal from there. So one, two, three, four, five, six. 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 One, two, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. And then on the last one, just for a bit of variation, I'll switch my D chord to its related minor, which is B minor. Um, you can always replace a chord with its related minor as long as it's chord as long as it's not chord five. Chord five has to be chord five. So here's the last one. One, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six. So that is a really useful progression which I find myself playing um with an alarming degree of repetitiveness. Um, but it, yeah, it's really, really handy. It does sound great with most tunes. And if you listen out for that progression, I bet you will hear a lot of um, your favourite guitarists using very similar progressions to that with that kind of syncopation, probably using that chord to slide into the chord four. So I'll just demonstrate the whole thing once through so you've got an idea, and then we'll move on. So one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, Five, six, and again, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three. This time it's gonna be B minor. Six, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, 
five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six. Just a last thing on that one as well. You'll notice when I do these syncopated changes, I really accentuate whichever upstroke I'm changing chord on, just to make it really clear that that syncopation is there. If you do it without accentuating that, then the syncopation is not really as noticeable and people won't get that kind of funky feel of kind of wanting to dance from the syncopation. They'll just go, oh, we changed the chord a bit early. Um, <laughs> so yeah, it's really worth trying to accentuate those upstrokes that you change on. Um, does anyone have any questions about that at all? Or anyone going to have a go at it? Brave the, uh, <laughs> the syncopation exercise. Okay, we'll uh, we'll move on then. So that's um, that's that one. Another thing I really like doing in drop D is, as I was saying before, um, the low frequencies are much more important than the high frequencies. And if you're thinking about set building and dynamics, you tend to find most guitarists, the sort of um, classic Irish sound. Oh, syncopation. Could you explain? Yes, um, syncopation is when you deliberately um, accentuate beats which are not the on beats. So in a jig, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six. So if it's going along at speed like one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, your your one and your four, first and fourth quaver in every bar, those are the, the on beats, the ones that your foot taps on. In a reel, it's simpler because there's only there's there's four crotchets in each bar, so one, two, three, four, one, two, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, dun da 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 not dominant and makes one of the others dominant and generally you find if you move a chord change an accentuated chord change a quaver too early um, that kind of syncopation is a thing that really grabs people and adds kind of dance energy if you listen to old funk records they're always doing it it'd be like um, uh, kind of um, deliberately moving the chord change a little bit before the start of uh, where your foot would actually tap and that is what kind of feels like it's dragging the dance floor along a little bit uh, and it works just as well in Irish music as well and often with Irish music you might want to listen to the melody there's a lot of melodies where you might particularly want to accentuate a beat which is not the on beat um, so you might want to accentuate just before the on beat or just after it even, uh, which is another form of syncopation. Um, and that is really dependent on what the melody is doing. A lot of the times there might be a high note that you'd like to accentuate and it's on the maybe the second quaver of a bar or something like that. Um, if you're interested in this idea as well, I had a really interesting conversation with um, Duncan Cameron, whose um, videos I've been using to demonstrate stuff on these streams for quite a while now. We got together over Zoom uh, last weekend, and I, that's going to be released tomorrow, um, a little video of the, like, the best bits compilation of our conversation. And one thing that he talks about a lot in Can Canadian music, they have a lot of tunes where um, the rhythm is not on the on beats deliberately, or even where the bars change length dependent on the melody. And so we had a little chat about that and how you can kind of... Um, take that idea and apply it to, to Celtic music as well, um, which might interest you, which is out tomorrow afternoon, half past twelve. Um, anyway, yeah, so I hope that gives you an idea of syncopation. Um, I may actually make a video specifically about what it is at some point in the not too distant future. I'll put it on the topics list to cover. my list. So. 
Ginkgo Patient. Cool. Yeah, let's move on to um, this bass thing I wanted to talk about. I really like power chords and um, I often show them to people. Um, one place I particularly like to use them, which I don't get to show people that much, is um, if you're in drop D playing in D major. Um, oh, hey, Yvonne. Yeah, he's great. Yeah. Yeah, he's a really interesting guy to chat to as well. Yeah. Um, but yeah, if you're in D, uh, major or minor actually, the D power chord is really nice with the drop bottom string. So you've got D, D, A, D, and that's a really nice, it's going to boom, it's not really got any emotional content because there's no thirds and no extra notes, but it's just going to boom under your tune and provide a nice drone for, drone? Provide a nice drone for the tune to rock along over the top of. So if I was playing, um, let's take, um, uh, I don't know, a jig in D major, um, things and most of what I did there is just a D power chord and then I'm moving my index finger around to get um, G and adding my middle finger to get A and that is the three most important chords in that key. Um, I'm kind of using a D power chord with a little bit of palm muting just to muffle it slightly and that's a really nice effect and then as you're building your set you can gradually kind of add in more treble um, and kind of build it up so you're getting something like... And then you can build out into fuller chords, you know, it really adds a lot of energy as you go along. But the other thing you can do is build and build and build and then cut right back to your bassy thing and that actually adds energy as well. So you might do something like... Those kinds of things. Um, so yeah, I really like this effect. So just going back to the D power chord, um, first thing you'll need is the shapes, so you've got a D power chord is index finger on the 5th fret of the A string, ring finger on the 7th fret of the D string, and little finger on the 7th fret of the G string. I'm not going to include my top two strings because I don't really want the extra trebly notes, and E and B are not particularly nice in um, a D major chord anyway, so I'll just kind of mute them by letting my little finger just gently rest on them and when I'm strumming this we'll go back to a jig um, I've got this fat fleshy bit of my hand here just resting very gently pretty much on top of the uh, the bridge there it's pretty much sat on the saddle so it's barely touching the string but it only only just touches it <laughs> notice it's quite easy to strum pretty much completely from the wrist and keep that gently resting on the uh, on the saddle there. Um, when I do the upstroke at the end of each um, each bar, so one, two, three, four, five, six, I let that mute come up because that gives it a really nice rhythmic feel. And again, that's my syncopation. I'm accentuating the sixth quaver in the bar, so I'm accentuating one before the on beat and it sounds really cool. One, two, three, four, five, six, 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 one, two, three, four, five, six. 
five, six. Three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Something like that. So yeah, that's uh, two techniques that go really nicely together. For my chord four, my G chord, um, I'm just going to take my index finger and move it down a string. And that gives me this really nice, um, it's a G sus4 chord actually. Um, I know most people who are watching this right now are probably not big fans of Blink-182. But if you are big fans of Blink-182, all the small things... All those kinds of um, teeny bop... Um, what do you call it? Um, pop punk. Pop punk songs from the 90s loved this chord progression and that's where I actually got it from. But it does translate very nicely into folk music as well. Anyway, so you move your um, index finger down a string and that gives you G. G sus4, nice and teen angsty. <laughs> and if you put your uh, middle finger on the seventh fret of the bottom string, that gives you um, a... Oh, sorry, uh, that's A sus4, and the G chord is G, G, add 9, add 13, is it? What's that one? D, G, 11, 9, hmm, don't know what we'd call that one. G, add 9, add 11, I suppose. Doesn't matter anyway, it's basically G. Um, so yeah. D, G, index finger goes down a string, and A, middle finger goes on the seventh. And these two fingers are always staying where they are. And then there's one other thing I really like to do with this chord as well, which is just to slide my index finger into the fifth fret, so you get... These kinds of things. So going back to my jig in D, in D major, I could do... One other um, little thing I was doing there as well, you can get your F sharp minor by just putting that index finger on the 4th fret, still keeping those two where they were, and if you put the index finger on the 4th fret of the A string, that's your C sharp chord. So you've actually got a whole chord scale, almost. If I go down the chord scale, we've got D, C sharp, kind of, um, we'll skip out B minor. A, G, F sharp. So we're only missing B minor and E minor. Um, so yeah, that's a really nice little, uh, very simple thing to do that just sounds great. keys which um, drop D lends itself to particularly well. I mean the good thing about it is unlike Dadgad where certain keys are quite hard to play in Dadgad, like A major I find quite hard to play in Dadgad, although actually Duncan Cameron again did actually show me a cool thing for A major in Dadgad the other day which I hadn't thought of and um, so that's nice. I'll make a video about that. In fact let me put that on the list as well. I'll make a video about that at some point. Um, but yeah, um, Dadgad, it's harder to do some keys in it because of the, the nature of the open strings. Uh, whereas Drop D pretty much is very versatile and it's also very easy to get back to standard from it. 
by just changing the, the bottom string. Um, so the second key that works really well in drop D is either of the D minor modes, so D Dorian or um, D Aeolian. Um, for these, there's a set of chords I really like to use. They are based around bar chords, which I know will put some people off, but they're really good for playing at speed because you can just slide between them. Um, so if you play a D minor 7, which is a bar on the 5th fret, and then use your other two fingers to make a shape that looks like A minor 7, like that. Um, that's a really nice chord one in either of the D minor modes. If you slide that bar down two frets and put your um, little finger on the fifth fret of the B string, there you've got a C7, which is a really nice um, chord seven in either of the D minor modes. If you want a Dorian sound then, you go down to um, G slash B, which is just two fingers it's index finger on the second fret of the A string or little finger on the third fret of the B string. And then if you want a better Dorian sound, you can add your uh, middle finger to give you this kind of B minor seven shape. So your middle finger's on the second fret of the G string. Um, so that's if you're really going for the Dorian sound, you get something like. And then you're down to A minor seven as your chord five. So that's D minor 7, C7, um, B minor 7 is what I'm actually playing there, but that's um, a substitute for B diminished, basically. And then A minor 7. If you're going for the Aeolian sound instead, um, which I prefer for the D minor modes generally, uh, you can go D minor 7, C7, then slide your C7 chord down two frets so the root is B flat, bar on the first fret, and then add your middle finger there so that you've got B flat major 7. And that's really nice. I love that chord. Um, and then you're down to A minor, same as before, A minor 7. So that for the Aeolian sound you get... And then for the rest of your chord scale, you just use that slidey shape that I touched on before. So then it goes G minor, F or F sharp, depending whether you're Dorian or Aeolian. And then E minor, and then you're back to D minor again. So that gives you a whole chord scale. You might have noticed as I was going up there, I uh, didn't actually play the bar. And this is a really nice, this is one of the many reasons that I like doing D minor in, um, in drop D, is if you take those bar chord shapes and actually don't bar them and just put the index finger on what, whatever the root note is, those open strings, the G and the E, actually sound quite cool with, with most of the chord scale. So if I do the whole thing without bars, it would sound like this. <laughs> For that one you ah that's really nice actually as your b flat chord if you um just have the three fingers on and no bar that's still a kind of b flat major type chord but it's a much more um <laughs> tortured soul kind of b flat chord i suppose um yeah so yeah i i think that i think those are all really nice um useful useful shapes as well if you're in d minor The last thing I want to say about D minor is, I've talked before about how you can um, mix and match between Dorian and Aeolian. So if you've got a tune in D Dorian, which is a common folk mode, or potentially a tune in D Aeolian, which is less common, um, you can actually borrow the chords from the other minor mode 
and use a bit of both. What you need to avoid is using, if the, you'll find in folk tunes the sixth note is not very often used in a minor key. The sixth note is, is a rare, a rare sighting. Uh, if the sixth note is in a bar, however, you have to play the chord which matches with it. So if I'm in D minor, if I'm in D Dorian, the sixth note is D, E, F, G, A, B. So if there's a B, um, a B flat, that's um, D Aeolian. And if there's a B natural, then that's D Dorian. So the tune probably won't have that note in it very often, so that means I can play either either chord, um, B flat major or or B something like B diminished, some sort of substitute for that. But if that note is in the tune, then I have to play whichever one matches with the note. Um, anyway, what this means is there's a really nice um, chromatic thing you can do, and I do it all the time in D minor. So you might do something like D minor 7, D minor 7, D minor 7, A minor 7. And then I'm going to play my B flat chord without a bar, so B flat. And then I'm going to slide that finger up one fret, slide the index finger up one fret, which gives me um, a kind of B, more or less B diminished. And then I slide back up to C7. And that's my, that's replacing my chord 5. So altogether that progression was D minor 7, D minor 7, A minor 7, B flat without the bar, index finger up one, and then C7. Something like that. Um, and I, f I just think that little chromatic link is really nice. And you can also use it going downwards as well to get a sort of blues song kind of vibe. So. Something like that. And that's um, a common pop chord progression as well. Um, yeah, so that's some things that are nice to do in, in D minor. Um, what else have we got here? Do, 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 do. Um. Ah, tunes in G. Um, tunes in G work really well in drop D because you get this really nice low note for the fifth. And um, <laughs> this is a good excuse for a shameless plug, isn't it? I wrote a tune in G, a tune in, an arrangement of a tune in G played in drop D. Uh, it's in this book, Irish Tunes for Fingerstyle Guitar, which I wrote and you can buy. Um, and if you buy it, then I will have um, more money to pay the bills at the end of the month and I will keep making free YouTube videos. So do go and get it if you like um, fingerstyle arrangements of Irish tunes. Most of them in it are um, in standard tuning. There's a few in uh, drop D as well in there. So I'll put a little link there. But... Um, yeah, tunes in, in G major work well in drop D. I haven't got much to say about this one, apart from that your chord one, um, don't use the slidey shape that I told you about before. You can use that for all the other chords in G, but for chord one it'll sound a bit weak. Uh, a nicer chord one, if you're in G major, is this shape. Um, so bottom two strings on the fifth fret, then middle finger on the fourth fret of the G string, and then the index finger is optional, but that goes on the um, third fret of the, the B string. That's your chord one in G major. And then for all the others, you can use your slidey shape. So if you've got a mode wheel, look up um, G Ionia. Let's have a look, see what it says. So you'd have... G major, A minor, B minor, C major, D major, E minor, and F sharp diminished. Um, and so you can get most of those with the slidey shapes. So there's G major. Slide it up to and move the index finger to the minor position. That's going to give you your A minor. With some extra notes in it, but I think they're quite nice. Slide it up two more. You've got B minor. 
um, slide it up one more and make the index finger major and that gives you C. And then for D, um, you could play it all the way up here. You probably won't, you'll probably just play D, but if you wanted to, you could play it up there as well. So, uh, yeah. In the other direction, if you're going down from G, G, slide it down one, make it minor, you've got an F sharp diminished substitute. Slide it down one more and add the extra finger at the bottom, that's your E minor chord. And there's D, you chord five. And of course, because you're in drop D, all the standard shapes will work for the other chords as well. So C is still C, miss off the bottom string. Um, for your third chord, you might want B minor, you might want B minor seven like that, which is nicer than B minor. You might play lazy B minor seven like that, or you might just play G slash B, which is just two fingers and very good for changing to fast. And then there's A minor seven, which I'd use as the chord, chord two. So, G major, A minor 7, G slash B, C, and actually, because you're in drop D as well, if you slide that C shape up two frets, that's another really nice option for, for chord 5. Hey Ed, thanks for tuning in. Um, yeah, so there's, there's loads of options in G major, really good key, works well with drop D. Thumb of approval. Obviously then, if G major works well, that means E minor is going to work well as well. Um, e Aeolian is related to G Ionian, um, but E Dorian also works very well in drop D. I'm not going to cover that, it's all standard shapes, you can work them out yourself. Um, if you want to use the slidey shape with that, it does work perfectly well, something like... So it's slidey shapes very much applicable in E minor um, and standard chords all are as well. Very good, very good, very good. Um, I had something in mind that I wanted to move on to then and I've briefly forgotten what it was, bear with me. Um, oh yes, so um, G major is related to A Dorian, as I'm sure you all know. Uh, G Ionian and A Dorian have got all the same notes and therefore all the same chords in. Except that if you're playing in A Dorian, obviously your your chord one is going to be your main chord, which is A minor. And so this A minor chord, which is a bit vague, it's not very definitely A minor. It's got too many extra notes in it. And so I wouldn't use that as chord one if I were playing in in A Dorian. What I would use instead is this with um, a little mini bar at the top, barring the top three strings on the fifth fret, and then um, ring finger on the seventh fret, the bottom string, and little finger on the seventh fret of the uh, A string. Or ignore the little finger and just um, leave the A string ringing, because obviously an A in an A chord is fine. Um, so there's two options for that one. Um, you might also want to not do the mini bar, leave the top two strings in the chord. Um, I'm going to pause for just a second because I think my internet's playing up. But yeah, if you don't do the mini bar and you just um, leave the top two strings in the chord, that kind of sounds quite nice. If you are going to use that one though, you may want to do the muty bassy thing that I talked about before. something like that to begin with because that'll get the listener used to hearing A as the root note and then when you add these extra notes in at the top and kind of fuzz your chord up a bit then that'll be okay because they've already acclimatised to being in A minor. Um, so yeah if I am playing in A Dorian which I do a lot in drop D um, I would use this for my chord one but probably mute it a bit to begin with. And I do actually leave the D string in it because I like that clash. I think it's quite nice. Um, then for G, use the slidey shape. Then again, if we're in A Dorian, we can use either F sharp, um, 
F sharp diminished it would be if we were in A Dorian, or F natural as it would be in A Aeolian. And I like to do my chromatic link thing that I was talking about before with, with both of those. So, um, that's E minor, then F, then F sharp, and that leads me nicely into G. One other chromatic link you can do nicely in A Dorian as well, and in fact in any Dorian mode, but I'll show you this one quickly. Um, I did it right at the end there. Something like that. So I'm playing G, G major with my slidey shape, and then I'm playing G sharp with my slidey shape. I'm keeping the index finger where it is and just moving the uh, middle finger up one. And that really leads nicely back into A minor. And that is, a, that is really a trick that I've borrowed from classical music and jazz, where they do this thing called um, using the, the leading tone to make chord 5 or, or chord 7 want to resolve back to chord 1. Um, of the notes in a scale, if you think about the chromatic scale, one of the most unstable ones which will sound the least nice when played with the root note is the seventh, the major seventh note. Um, the major seventh note, if you hear it in the accompaniment, really wants to resolve back to the, the first note. So basically, if I add that G sharp note in one of my chords, it's going to make my ears want chord one next. So that's what I'm doing there. Like that. But it basically just makes a nice little bass line going chromatically from G back to A again. That kind of thing. Um, so yeah, that's another another little thing to think about. And this, this slidey shape is basically really good for these chromatic things because it's always just a matter of moving one finger. So uh, it's nice to play about with those. Last thing on the subject of A Dorian is that if you want to be a bit cheeky with your jazzy chords, using the A minor chord I mentioned before with a little mini bar, goes really nicely into D9, and D9 now has a, a low bass note on it, so you can get this really cool Django Reinhardt 70s funk kind of chord progressions going on. doing there is A minor, A minor, A minor, and change to D7, if you, uh, sorry, D9 rather. If you want to be cheeky with your D9, then slide into it, or slide down to it, so either from a fret below or from a fret, be but, a fret above. Um, so, back to the beginning. A minor, A minor, A minor, D and then I'm going to use my chromatic link to go from F all the way back up to A minor again. So F, F sharp, G, G sharp, and then I'm back to A minor. And this G to G sharp thing, both of those can replace chord 5, so that in your last bar of the section, your, your seventh foot tap, Having the G and G sharp link there is all good, and it'll lead you nicely back to chord one. So that's a good way of finishing sections. Um, last thing I'd like to do then is I'm just going to use that progression I just mentioned. I'll demonstrate it along with a classic tune in um, in A Dorian, which is the Gravel Walks. Great reel. Uh, there's a link to it. Um, so I'm just going to play along with this, and I'm going to use those chords that I just talked about. Um, and maybe mess about with some other chromatic links with the slidey shape as well. Uh, we'll, see, we'll see how it goes. Uh, actually, for the viewers at home, I'll just turn him up a bit. He's quite quiet at the moment, isn't he? 
you could use those things. So all I was playing there was A minor, D9, F, F sharp, G, G sharp, and then just sliding that slidey shape around. <laughs> um, this is why I say it's important and useful to practice chord scales because um, the more facility you can get with changing between shapes in a chord scale, particularly shapes which share fingers in common or which you can slide between, um, the more fluid your chord progressions sound. Um, so yeah, it's a really handy little exercise to do that. Um, so I suppose the main things to take away from today are drop D is really good, go and play about with it. Um, it's, it's great tuning, it's easy to get your head round, easier than Dad Gal, I think. Um, it works well in D, works well in G, works well in D minor, works well in A minor, and it also works well in E minor. In exactly the same way, you just use the slidey shapes and standard chord shapes. Uh, isn't the B natural in F a bit too out there? B natural in F? Um, do you mean the B natural in D minor? I'll, f I'll finish my key takeaways bit anyway while we wait for it to, to find out. <laughs> yeah, um, if you're in A minor, D9 is really good in drop D. Um, if you're in D minor, I like to use those little chromatic links um, and the same with A minor. So yeah, that's about it really. The slidey shape F major voicing. Um... B natural in F. Ah, I see what you mean. You mean... You mean, should there not be a B natural in an F chord there? Um, I don't think so. To me, it sounds nice. I like, I like the sound of it. Because the, the context in which I use it is deliberately mixing um, Aeolian and Dorian together anyway. Um, so, no, I don't think it's too out there. <laughs> um, sharp 4. Uh, F, G, A, B. Yes, I suppose it is. Yeah, it is a, it is a, a raised 4th. Um, this is just a general thing though, Noah. Um, if, if you were playing, if I, if I were playing in F major, or you were playing in F major, you can't have a, a raised fourth in your one chord if you're playing in F major, obviously, because um, the tune has got, uh, the tune has got no raised fourth in it, you know, the tune's got a natural fourth in it. So if you played a chord with a raised fourth in it, it would probably, the fourth would probably crop up in the tune and it would clash. And it, it wouldn't really sound right anyway if you're based in that key to play a, a raised fourth. But if you're in the key of a um, a Dorian or a Aeolian, it's perfectly natural for there to be a B natural in both of those modes. Uh, it's the it's the second note in a Dorian and a a, a, a Aeolian. Um, so if no matter what chord I play, if I add an extra note to it, you know, an extra chord tone, and the tone that I add is from within my root scale, for folk purposes it'll always sound fine. So in the context of it being an F chord in its own right, it's quite weird to have a raised fourth in it, but because that raised fourth note is in the scale 
of um, the tune that I'm accompanying, then it then it works okay. And that's true for any chord as well. If you're adding chord extensions, if you're thinking of jazz chords that'll fit with a folk tune, so long as the notes that you add are from within that tune scale, it should always work. Uh, yeah, there is actually. Um, uh, I don't know if you. I don't know if you've if you've got this or seen it, but um, I wrote a book, and it's got. There's actually a chapter about adding. Um, adding. Um, adding notes from the scale two chords to come up with interesting chord extensions is is covered in it. So that if you want a list of other possibilities, there's actually a table in there that lists all the um, lists all the the possibles for different modes. Um, yeah, thanks for your question. That was a good. That was. A, it's really nice to have a a, a good question um, to try and think about as well. Uh, does anything else I can um, I can help anybody with? Or is it tea time? <laughs> ah, brilliant! I th do you know what? I thought I recognised your name, actually. Yeah. Uh. Oh, thanks for getting it, anyway. I think um, I think that is it for today then um, yeah so I'll be back next Friday at half past five um, next Friday I'm not sure what the topic will be yet but uh, it'll be um, standard folky Fridays and the following Friday I'm gonna go and uh, visit my mum so we'll have a special guest again um, which will be nice. We're going to do a special session on set building and dynamics and how to practice palm muting and using palm muting and subtle alterations of the chords to build a lot of energy as your set goes through. So that'll be in two weeks. Next week, I'm not sure what it'll be, but it'll be equally as good, I'm sure. Um, thank you all very much for tuning in. Um, thanks, Keith. Thanks, Yvonne. Oh. Ah, now we're barraged with things. What have we got? Coming out of these open shapes in drop D from Dad Gad perspective. Seems like the Wild West. As the open strings are so well behaved in Dad Gad. Yeah, um, the open strings are less well behaved in this tuning for certain keys. But um, as I was saying before, you know, if as long as the notes are from the scale, they'll sound okay. Um, as a general principle as well, if you add chord tones lower down in pitch within a chord, that's going to muddy up your chord. Um, you can do it, but you want to do it sparingly. But at the higher end of the frequency spectrum, extra chord tones, as long as they're from within the, the key scale, they don't really add mud. They just make the chord sound vague and floaty. Like my A minor there, for example, with a B and an E at the top of it. it kind of sounds okay. It's a bit conflicted, but that's quite nice for a, a dark tune in A minor. So, um, so yeah, you can you can get away with that. You just have to bear in mind what the open strings are and think whether they're going to clash in the key that you're in. Uh, and obviously, just trust your ears is the simplest way of doing it, isn't it? If you play something and it sounds rubbish, don't play it again. Um, what else we got? Yvonne says, going back to syncopation, you can just play around with humming tunes and tapping, experimenting and accentuating different notes and beats so you feel it with your whole body. Absolutely, yeah, I totally agree. Um, that's a great thing to do. Um, and another nice thing to do as well is if you write one, two, three, four, five, six, down, up, down, up, down, up, or down, up, down, down, up, down, if you subscribe to that way of strumming jigs, then just pick out quavers at random, circle them or, or, or highlight them or underline them or whatever you want to do, and um, try and accentuate those ones and just see how it affects the rhythm. And then you can learn each of those as a, as a a variation in its own right. Just pick out the ones that you like and try and practice those 
and then you've got some little variations that you can add into your strumming as you're going along. And you can also deliberately practice changing chords on different beats of the bar just to see how it sounds. That's a really good little exercise and quite fun. <laughs> Yvonne as well, I really like what you're saying there about um, practicing things without having a guitar. There's so much music practice you can do without having a guitar. And the best music practice I think that you can do without having a guitar is uh, ear training. Because if you can hear a tune in your head and then hum between the notes within it and work out what the intervals are, that's fantastic ear training. That doesn't require any instruments. You can finger the scale as you're doing it. So that's going to link up your, your ear to your fingers. And that actually works better if you haven't got a guitar because you're having to hear what the note would be as you fret the imaginary guitar. Uh, that's the best guitar practice and you don't even need a guitar for it. So um, yeah, I really recommend that as well. It's a, it's a great idea. I like your idea of um, humming tunes and tapping, accentuating different ones. That's cool. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. It, it, it um, prevents you from getting coronavirus as well. So it's win, 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 isn't it really? It's like that Stanley Miller thing, isn't it? When he said, uh, go and sing on a crowded bus. If you think you're, you're free to do what you want, sing on the top deck and no one would do it. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, cool. Anyway, right, I'm going to leave it there. I'm going to go get some tea. Thank you all very much for tuning in. Um, I will see you all next week at Friday at half past five. Um, follow the Facebook if you don't already. You'll get a, a link when when it's uh, available. And uh, the Duncan Cameron video is out tomorrow afternoon. So check that out as well if you're interested in seeing what he had to say. Um, yeah, interesting bloke. A really good chat. So I think that'll be useful to some people that are interested in tunings and um, interesting Canadian music and how the Celtic traditions melded with other traditions and uh, all sorts of good stuff. So yeah, I'll be back very soon. And next weekend's video is going to be about partial capoing. I've ordered my partial capo today. I can't wait to have a play with it. So uh, loads of good stuff coming out. I'll see you all soon.